Hello everybody and welcome back to The Big Hit. I'm here with IEP head coach Paul Tortorella. Thank you so much for joining me today. No problem. So, uh, let's just start off with the beginning. In 1995, you joined the Crimson Hawks as the defensive coordinator. And for, you, for that, you served the position for 22 years. Uh, in 2012, however, you were named the NCAA Defensive Coordinator of the Year. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Um, that year, you had IUP's defense leading the nation in rushing defense, or best scoring defense, and third best rushing defense. Very impressive, by the way. I really like that set. Appreciate it. But along with those accolades, though, you had arguably one of the most impressive and crucial defensive games of your career when you faced Shippensburg in the PSAC Championship game. Their offense was one of the best in the nation. They led the nation in total offense and were second in scoring offense with 46.8 points per game. However, you limited them to only 10 points per game and 271 yards in that game. So my question exactly is, how would you go about game planning defensively for a high powered offense like that? Well, the interesting thing about it is they did so much uh, in regards to all their different formations and plays that we actually had to be very simple. Uh, we basically played two or three defenses the whole game. Uh, the familiarity with only repping that many defenses in practice for our guys against all the different things that they did gave us the best chance to get repetition in practice for, for Saturday when we played in the game. And uh, we went the other way. They were a very complicated offense and we actually simplified on defense and didn't make a lot of calls and tried to stick you know, with our game plan with just making a couple calls. And when it was working and we got the lead, we just kind of stayed with it until we got to third down. So uh, as crazy as it sounds, we actually simplified and probably used maybe one third of our defensive game plan going into that game. Wow, so pretty much when you found out what you were doing with work and you just said, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so, yeah, yeah, you could look at it that way, yep. Yeah, so how did you change up like from doing simplified stuff to third down stops? Well, it, it third down, they were a totally different type of offense and uh, we were able to do some different things, you know, on third down defensively. Uh, they were so good that they very rarely were in a lot of third mediums or longs. You know, they, they'd go games where they were only in eight or nine third down plays because they First and second down, they were making first down, scoring a lot of points, having a lot of success. So we felt like if we could get them in third down in a good situation, we could flip the script a little bit and then get into a little bit of a different plan. And that's kind of how we went about it. Wow, that's honestly very impressive. Um, but sticking with the defensive theme, you've coached some of the most talented athletes to ever step on that field, uh, including Jamal Everett and Damon Lloyd, who is also a two-time All-American and currently plays for the Los Angeles Chargers Correct. as a linebacker. So what exactly separates a, a linebacker or a player like Lloyd from a player or linebacker that you may not know? What's like, is it his worth e work ethic? Is it his talent? What is it? Well, the first thing, the, those type of great players love to play the game. You know, you have a lot of great players, but the, the best ones are ones that love to play. They practice well. They're, they're good teammates. Uh, they work as hard as anybody or harder than anybody on the team. Uh, their want to is greater than anybody else on the team. So don't get me wrong, you have to have talent, but you also got to love to play the game and got to work at it and want to be a great teammate. And, and he, he was one of the best practice players we've ever had here. So would you maybe say, would you, uh, want heart more than talent? Or do you think talent is kind of like you can get there, but heart is like if you have it or you don't? Well, if you have both, that, that's what makes you a great player. The, the players that uh, have a lot of talent that don't have heart you usually underachieve. Uh, the, the, the guys that have heart and maybe aren't as talented usually overachieve. Now that doesn't make them a great player, but they could become a, a pretty good player. You know, if they don't have a lot of talent, but they, they, they have a lot of heart and character, and they, the want to uh, is big at this level. 
When I was in high school, I got a little bit of a glimpse into the recruiting process when recruiting high school athletes because some of my player or my teammates went to Penn State, Yale, Mercer, and Clarion. So my question is, how or what do you look for in a high school athlete or high school football player that would make you want to recruit them to come here and play? Well, obviously the first thing, you know, talent and, and athleticism and, uh, you know, how hard they really play. You know, you can tell on a film and a video, you know, everybody can watch a highlight reel of everybody and they always look great, but if you watch a game film and a couple games and uh, those guys that never take a playoff, they play hard, great effort. Uh, those are the guys that stand out. Now they have to have talent. You know, there's a lot of kids that play hard and give great effort that aren't talented enough to play at this level. But, you know, those, those are the guys that if they have talent and, and, and they play hard every play, uh, they play both ways in high school, so they never leave the field most of the time. Those are the guys that we really try to, to recruit to get to come here. Okay, so as far as I go, I'm obviously only 5'7 and very short, so do you think height is a, is a big leg up? Well, it, I, I think size, you know, you, you know, if you're going to recruit a lineman at this level, you know, if, if a guy's under 260 pounds, he's probably not going to hold up it, on either the offense or defensive line. Uh, you know, the skill position sometimes, you know, we, we have five, couple five, eight guys that are pretty good skill players. Uh, but usually when you look at offense and defensive line, uh, size probably is a little, well, I wouldn't say a little, is a lot more important than it is when you're a skill player. Yeah, because those defensive linemen, they can be in the 300 plus. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We've got, you know, both our offensive tackles are 320 pounds. Uh, defensive tackle and nose guard are both 315 pounds. But they got to be good players, too. Yeah. Just, you, you know, it's a, it's a six, one half dozen the other. You got to have the size, but you, you got to be a good player, too. Yeah. So when those guys get here from high school, do they immediately go into this specialized, like, remedy of, of physical training and sure. physical therapy? Describe to me exactly how would maybe a uh, high school lineman start kind of transitioning into the daily life of a college athlete? Well, first of all, most linemen in high school play both ways, offense and defense, so that, that doesn't happen at this level. So when they come here, they're either offense or defensive linemen, they're specialized. So that's a, they get a head start there and they don't have to worry about playing on both sides of the ball. Our uh, weight program, you know, some of these guys play other sports in high school so they don't lift weights year round. Well, when you come here and you just play football, you lift year-round. Uh, we usually uh, redshirt most of our linemen that we recruit out of high school. Uh, like this year, the linemen that we brought in, they're, they're all going to redshirt. Uh, a lot of the linemen that we have playing for us now on both sides of the ball have, have redshirted, so they're a little bit older, a little bit mat mature. It takes them about a year to get used to the speed of the game. Yeah. And uh, it's tough to come in and it's a little easier to be a skilled player and play as a true freshman than it is a lineman. There's just a lot more involved in it. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, so I would like to mention uh, College Football Hall of Fame coach, uh, Frank Signetti Sr., one of the legendary IUP head coaches of all time. Um, he has the record for the most wins in IUP history with 182. It took him 38 games to reach 30 wins, but for you, it took 35. So my question is, what does it mean to you to not only win or have 30 wins faster than any IUP head coach in history, but to, you could be well on your way to be the best head coach in school history? Well, I'd, I'd pump the brakes on that first of all, but uh, you know, if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be in the situation I'm in. Uh, you know, I, when I first came here as the defensive coordinator, obviously he was my boss and I came here to work for him, learned a lot from him. Uh, so he's been a big, big help in my uh, advancement, you know, not only as an assistant and a coordinator, but also becoming the head coach. We do a lot of the things in the program with, uh, you know, the same things we did with, with Coach Signetti that, that we still do today uh, in our program with, with me as the head coach. Um, you know, I doubt very seriously if I'll ever get to that many wins uh, in my lifetime, but uh, you know, he was a great mentor and, uh, 
you know, you've got to have good players. We had good players when he was here and I was a coordinator and we've got really good players now. And the thing that I learned from him uh, very quickly and then I learned again as a head coach is you're only as good as your staff. Uh, it's not a one man show by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, if you don't have a great staff, you can't win the way we've won here you know, over the last 25 or 30 years. And, and I'm sure Coach Signetti would be the first one to tell you that. So when the process of recruiting your staff, is that similar or a little bit different to recruiting high school athletes? There's a familiarity, you know, you know, a loyalty, kind of like a, a trust factor where, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, you want to build a staff with all the guys that you actually know or friends with. But, you know, if they're good coaches and you have a familiarity with them and you know their character and you know them personally, you're usually, you know, going to make a good decision on a guy like that. Uh, you know, if you really don't know a person outside of football or, you, you know, personally, sometimes it's, it's a crapshoot when you hire a coach, uh, no matter how good of a coach they are. Because it, it's a chemistry that's got to work. Uh, I think we've got a great chemistry on our staff, you know, because a lot of the guys that are on my staff were assistants when I was the coordinator. So we don't have a whole lot of new coaches, so to speak, that, that have come in from other places. We, we, we still have a, a pretty uh, strong group of, of what I call IUP guys that either coached here or played here for, for a pretty long time. Yeah. So I mentioned previously that you were defensive coordinator for 22 years, and this is your now your fifth season right. as a head coach. Um, are there, I imagine there are some differences between the two. Can you maybe elaborate on exactly what those differences are? Well, the first one, and it, obviously, when, you, when you're the defensive coordinator, you're, 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 you're pretty much the head coach of the defense. Uh, you know, when I worked for Coach Signetti, he was an offensive coach. So, you know, in that respect, I was pretty much the head coach of the defense. So you, you just worried about the defense. Now as the head coach of obviously of the football program, you, you, you kind of got to worry about everything, offense, defense, special teams, recruiting, uh, management of the players, management of your staff, uh, you know, some young coaches that you bring in, you actually have to coach the coaches a little bit when you're the head coach. So. Uh, you know, and then the final decision is yours. You know, if you're out there and it's fourth and inches and, you know, if you're the defensive coordinator, you're not going to make the decision to go for it. It's the head coach's decision, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I, I take a lot of input from my staff, but uh, the bottom line is on Saturday, uh, when you're in the heat of battle, you, you, you got to make the final call. And, you know, sometimes it's good and sometimes it, it doesn't work, but you, you got to be, uh, strong in your convictions that uh, you're doing the best thing for the situation that you know something that happens last Saturday might not be the same situation as next Saturday so you may do something different because it's not the exact same situation so you got to kind of just take each game as it is and, and try to make the best decision to help your team win all right folks that was the interview with head coach Paul Tortorella now let's travel over to beautiful Indiana Pennsylvania the sun is shining the students are hyped up, the food trucks are out, and it's just about game time. The IEP Crimson Hawks take on the Shepherd Rams on this warm September evening. Now let's go down to our sideline reporter for the pregame show. And welcome back as the IUP Crimson Hawks look to take game number two against an undefeated Shepherd University Rams. Good afternoon, I'm Alexander Donaldson. With me, color analyst Jay McGarry and our sideline reporters Stanley, er Danny Erb and Sonia Demichek joining us in just a bit. Jay, these two teams are playing each other for the first time this season, yet they have a significant and recent history together. That they do, Alex. These two teams last met in 2019 in the first round of the NCAA Division II Collegiate Playoffs. IUP came into that tournament 11-1, while Shepard was sporting a 10-2 record. Still, the Rams prevailed in that meeting, 31 to 27. Then freshman Tyson Bajan threw for 389 passing yards and four touchdowns, securing a Rams win. Shepard would then be handed a second round exit by IUP rival Slippery Rock. That game was a heartbreaking loss for the Hawks, and they'll certainly be out for revenge today. But Tyson Bajan is certainly still a threat as he looks to go three and oh in a starting role so far this season. 
He's completed 55 of 74 passing attempts, totaling 709 yards with nine touchdowns and only one interception so far. While his aerial attack has been near flawless, they'll look to sophomore running back Ronnie Brown. The 5'11 sophomore has been handed the ball just 12 times in his first two games. However, he has put up 143 yards and two touchdowns. That is not a bad average to have. Not a bad average at all, Alex, but let's not get too ahead of ourselves. IUP has an offense that is certainly nothing to sneeze at. Last week, Crimson Hawk QB Javon Davis went 20 for 30, didn't throw a single interception, and also converted on a two-point conversion. A lot of that success is owed to the Hawks' offensive line. Michael Jua, Colin Piechkova, and All-American Josh Doberman gave Davis plenty of time in the pocket and didn't give up a single sack against a formidable Kutztown defense. We'll just have to see if the Rams' pass rush has any more luck against those men in the trenches today. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to a possibly high-scoring game between these two two teams as we look forward to this contest. But before, we'll then we'll send it to Danny Erb, our sideline reporter, who will discuss the PSAC Players of the Week, two of which were chosen to be Crimson Hawks, one of which was a defensive tackle that put up a pick six. Zach nominated two Crimson Hawks as Players of the Week. They nominated Dylan Grubbs for his automatic performance against Kutztown. In five kickoffs, he totaled 292 yards and scored 253 yards in just five punts. This led to an average of 50 yards every time he set up on the gridiron. Also, defensive end Ronnie Michelle landed the second spot on the list, putting up four total tackles, two of which were done solo. However, what made his performance very special was that interception he returned for a 26-yard touchdown, which ended up being the winning points IUP needed to win that football game. I certainly expect a great performance from both players today. Back to you, Alex. Always, always great to hear from you, Danny. As we look, as we get closer to this game, we should recognize that this is the Hall of Fame game, and we'll send it to our other sideline reporter, Sonia Demichek, who has a bit of background for this game. Sonia? He's inducting 12 former athletes into the hall today. Notably, out of these athletes, IUP will be inducting football's Leander Jordan, a former All-American guard. Not only did Jordan play for IUP, he was also selected in the third round of the 2000 NFL Draft by the Carolina Panthers, the second player taken overall. Jor Jordan played as both a guard and a tackle in the NFL. Spent two seasons with the Panthers, two with the Jacksonville Jaguars, before moving on to San Diego. Another former IUP football player will be inducted today, and but he is notably well known for his current administration role at Clemson University, the athletic director. While under supervision, Clemson has won two national championships, has claimed the last six Atlantic Conference titles, and produced NFL's number one draft pick quarterback, Trevor Lawrence. You can catch both Jordan and Rakovich being honored, along with 10 other inductees during halftime. Thank you, Sonia. Looking into some of that football history, a great history here at IUP. Now we look forward to hearing you from this game uh, as this game progresses. As we re reach the end of this IUP TV Sports pregame show, we continue a tradition started three years ago where we present our bold predictions known as Hulk Takes. Jay? Now, everybody gave a score today but me, so I'll throw one out there first. Uh, I believe the Hawks take this one on the foot of Dylan Grubbs, 33 to 30. I also believe that Dwayne Brown will score both a rushing and a receiving touchdown today. Certainly optimistic there, but I'm going to have to disagree with you. Uh, it's going to be a close game, but the Rams are going to take this one 34 to 28. It's going to be close coming down to the fourth quarter, I predict. But Bajan has thrown, he can, has shown that he can pull through, scoring 24 points and four touchdowns in his first two games in just the fourth quarter alone. It'll be tough if the IUP cornerbacks can handle it throughout the full game, and I think Bajan's going to pull through on the gridiron today. I think this one's going to be a battle with a lot of offense. Rip, that's it. My score. With the Hawks on top. Energy from last week's game, like the win and the support of the fans in the stands, I'm thinking IUP could definitely pull this win today with a score of 33 to 30. See how this one plays out. Stay tuned for the game. Coming up next as the IUP Crimson Hawks finish out their homestand against the Rams in the Hall of Fame game. Stay tuned. 
drops it off, and Anderson will take it. He'll get a good gain, and he'll move the sticks. Moving past the 40, evading defenders. Makes it inside the 30, over across, and out of the 20. So he goes right down the middle through the uprights, and that will do it for IUP's second drive of the game. That'll tie it at three with 2.46 remaining on the clock in the first quarter. Severs, he hands it off, and Anderson going down the middle. He's able to find space, and he'll make it up to the 35-yard line. That'll move the six. What a game he's playing, huh? Davis has yet to throw here. He's going to attempt it, and it gets blocked up inside, and it's caught. I mean, you did a good job of Great getting to it. Play. <laughs> but it's a loss for IUP after that completion. Red zone. What? The field goal attempt was too far in a one hand pull in. Great reception and moving the six. Brian Beach again, a great wide receiver for the Rams, and he'll move the six. The money. And his wide receivers have done well at. Keeping that in as he fakes a handoff, he gets it a far pass and that one on the money. And he's moving inside to 15, now to the 10, and he's taken down inside the five. So now second down after that gain of one. Ronnie Brown still in the backfield, Bajan under center. Bajan's gonna take it and he's swallowed up. Uh, he gets held up at the line. And the referee coming in here and she's going to say it's a touchdown. It, the defensive line there really got contact on him. Oh, yeah. And that's a rough call for IUP. And he'll fake the handoff, able to find space for a quick pass and moving up, getting a first down, taken down. Uh, not before he picks up the first down, getting on that Grant Smith. And he moves the six all the way up to the 46 yard line. The referees will spot it. As Tyler Luther, who's one for one today, and keeps it at two for two. So IUP trailing by four as they'll turn possession over to Tyson Bajan's offense. Oh, Bajan looking down the middle, will run for it, and he gets taken out. A fumble and able to recover it was number 54, Francisco Morat Burnett. And IUP able to force that fumble. Exactly what IUP. So Bajan scans his options, goes to the near side, and that near hash is able to receive it, and he moves ahead. Another key play that time. IUP, the rush coming, going inside. Bajan looking for the end zone, and it's caught. Beach with the touchdown. He's able to outrun the defender. In a, few, a few times in the first half, but so far hasn't had anything. And then breakthrough here, he makes it past midfield, only has a few defenders to go. He moves it to the middle, evades a two tackles, and he gets brought down. Beautiful run as he moves up by Chance Schwartz. They're on the quarterback. So third and 10 here, IUP needs a stop here. And Bajan looks to throw, he'll go into the end zone, and he's wide open. Wenzel again as he gets six points up on the board for the Shepherd University Rams and they lead 23 to six. Davis takes it. Great job by the offensive line to buy time and Charles takes it inside the 30, inside the 20 and he gets taken down to the 19. That's what we have been looking for all game from Irvin. And I believe you're right. a solid game. So third and five, he fakes the toss, and he has to get rid of it. He gets it to the one yard line, and he makes it into the end zone. And that is that is absolutely huge for the Crimson Hawks. Uh. Bajan, after that completion, looks down the middle, airs it out, and with wide open, plenty of room, Streeter flying for it, and he's unable to get to it. Excuse me, that was Stewart. Couldn't find receiver. Greg Leonard before he made it into the end zone. Another touchdown for the He's really stabled out. Absolutely. Got that arm a little warmed up. As that one gets into the touchdown. Josh Gondrick. Talking about Another warmed one. up. The sideline of the Rams are fired up. Davis with Malik Anderson. He looks to throw and he gets sacked. 
getting in there behind the defensive line, Richie Aguilar. Oh, a red shirt freshman. Still on. Davis takes a snap, scans his options, and goes right down the middle and able to hold on to it, but he's slow to get up. Pops right back up, and that might be enough for a first down. Beautiful play by the Cassad Carter. Let's see what he can do here. He scans his options, moves down the middle. He's facing pressure, and he's on the run. He's going to make the pass. A beautiful play. Finds Beach right down the middle. And he moves it up to the 44-yard line. Not enough to move the sticks, but certainly a good chunk taken out from that penalty. Takes a snap, scans his options, goes to the right side, wide open. Irvin Charles takes it and looking for a few yards, maybe gets three or four. Trying to find the 35-yard line, gets stopped short, and it gets pulled back to the 32. Every single play, every second he uh, can spend on this field matters. So Evans on the swing route, able to move it up the near sideline, and that'll move the sticks again. IUP, two in a row, gets the first down. And Key runs, but he's able to make those receptions as Brown fighting for it, just unable to get to it. Plenty of contact along the way. So a three possession game now as IUP has it. Evans takes it on the near sideline, trying to find a way inside. Able to break the tackle, a beautiful play, and he makes it up to the 21. Justice Evans able to evade multiple defenders, and he moves this earlier in the game from the Hawks. Davis looking to the right side, all the way to the end zone. Charles up for it, he gets it! Beautiful play, Urban Charles. Down, but not out. Now these two point conversions last week as he'll look to the right side to Charles. Again, he pushes up the defender and he makes the grab. Two points on the board for IUP. The score 37 to 21. So far on this drive, and he goes to pass it to the outside, and his target yet again found, and he's pushing for more yardage. Is that Gondrek again? Josh Gondrek. What a monster game for him. Bajan with five yards to go. No look to get it there. He's contacted, it's intercepted inside the end zone. He needs to go down, and he will. That is, that is that's huge. Bajan. Still looking at that clock. Certainly a much more reasonable game now. He gets rid of it down the field. Suman comes what down a with it. Wrapping around the head of safety, Ponce de Leon. Four wide. So Davis looking to his right side, giving plenty of time. Gets it to Carter, who stumbles and stays in play. Carter, you got to get out of bounds there, man. You've got to stop the clock. He was looking. IUP's actually done a pretty good job of the no huddle they offense. Oh, and he gets sacked. No fumble. It comes out. And it looks like the Shepherd Rams come down with it. Oh, a great handoff there as Swartz brings it up.